Hello, everyone. This is Rabbi Brian Balecci. We are live, ready to learn some Hebrew. So hopefully you can join us. And it's been exciting learning every Torah portion together with all of you. So we're grateful you have joined us. And we're excited that you're with us. And let us know that you're out there learning to not only study Hebrew, but how to speak the language and communicate to others. We're excited that you're out there. And if you want to make sure that you are part of this family, even watching on Facebook, let us know that you have questions, comments, thoughts, concerns. Give us a question out there. We'll even answer it live on the spot when we do our Q&A. And we definitely have some family out there from our synagogue and also those that will be joining us on Zoom today. So we're glad that you have joined us. And we are looking at this portion for this week. And this week is Parshat Korach, and it's coming from the book of Bar, the book of Numbers, which is the fourth book of the Torah, chapter 16, verse 1, and it goes all the way to 1832. Really a good portion to really talk about leadership, what to do and what not to do when you're a leader. So if you are ready to jump in today, we are going to look at the Aleph Bait. The word alphabet starts with the letter Aleph, and then we have the letter bait. We have the Aleph, which is the ox head of strength. And written from right to left, we write Aleph. And then we have the letter bait, which is a picture of a house. Together, we are really building the language of the house, the language of the Jewish people, the language of Hebrew, Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue. So we want you to subscribe. Let us know that you want to learn Hebrew with us. Or like letters like Gimel like we have the word gamal which means a camel and this is a pictograph of a camel or the teacher that taught the apostle paul gamliel we know it comes from the same root a camel loaded up with many possessions and blessings he was blessed and bestowed with blessings to share with not only the apostle paul Rav Shaul, but with all of us as we study the hebrew scriptures so we are going to jump into this portion and this portion is called Korach, and you know the name of this person who is the cousin of Moses and Aaron as Korah. So we are jumping in to learn the Aleph Bait, the Aleph Bait. So as we study the Aleph Bait together, uh, let us learn some Hebrew together, and we are going to dive right in and see where we can learn the language of Ivrit, the holy tongue. So Al Aleph and Bait together give us the alphabet. Aleph like alpha and bait like beta. In fact, let's take a look at how the Aleph influenced alpha or the letter bait influenced beta or modern Greek vita. In fact, the letter bait in Hebrew actually can have two different sounds. The letter B or the letter V based upon a dot that reoccurs in Hebrew called a dagesh. And this dagesh is the dot in the center that gives it a strong B sound, or removing the dagesh, the dot in the center, give us a, gives us a V sound, a softer B to a V. So we see that the aleph and the letter bet together give us the alphabet, the alphabet, aleph bet. So how does the aleph bet work? It works with 22 consonant letters. So these letters can be used as consonants. Uh, some of these letters are unique. They can be used as a prefix to give us a phrase. So you can put that prefix or that letter in front of a whole word and create a phrase. And even we even look at some of these letters as vowel indicators or they hold the presence of a vowel like the aleph the letter He, the letter Vav, the letter Yud, and the letter Ein. These vowels can actually be represented by consonants where you have certain Likud vocalization, Likud vocalization, which are the dots and points underneath the letter. So we would start with the vowel system that we know in English as A, E, I, O, and U, but we would pronounce it with the Spanish or Mediterranean or Middle Eastern sound of a, E, I, O, U. Try that at home. A, E, I, O, U. One more time. A, E, I, O, U. So here we have the Aleph, like the Greek Alpha, 
the bait, like the Greek beta or vita, and then dalit, a triangle, like the Greek delta. Gimel, which we talked about the gamal, the camel, is where we get gamma from, like gamal, gamma, gimel, gamma. You see the connection. If I draw the H in he, I get the E sound for epsilon in modern Greek. And this Nikud vocalization is used for us to sound consonants. And so we actually take the letter Aleph, which is silent, and it can have different sounds underneath it, the dots and dashes. And so that gives us different sounds that we can use. So for instance, we have the Aleph, which would give us the patach sound of ah, when we put the one line, patach, underneath it, ah, ah. We also have the longer form of that sound, kamats, ah, ah. So we have ah and ah. And even shorten it to ah, ah. Very important when we're looking at the letters, when we then see letters like, uh, when we see letters like Seire, we see Seire two dots side by side, we actually see the vowel E or the E sound, E, E. Same thing with this shorter E, so goal, three dots in a downward triangle. So if we understand how the vowel system works and we're looking at the A, E, I, O, and U, or a, e, i, o, u, we will start with one of those consonant letters and add a vowel, c plus v, and that will give us the first open syllable. Or we can have a closed syllable by adding an extra closing consonant, c plus v plus c, as we have in the word shalom, shalom, starting with reading from right to left as Hebrew is written, the letter Sheen, the 21st letter of the Hebrew Aleph Beit, or alphabet. This language, Ivrit, has 22 letters. The 21st letter is the letter Sheen. Underneath it is a little T symbol that we call Kamatz. Together, it will give us the sound Sha, Sha. So we have the first syllable in yellow, Sha, Sha. And then we have a Lamed, is a consonant, a vav with a dot on top. This vav with the dot on top actually means that it's changing from a V to an O sound. And the dot on top will remember its sound by saying, oh, look at that bird in the air. Because the dot is up in the air, we say it's an O. So it's no longer a V, it's an O. Because remember, we learned about these vowel indicators. The vav can be an O or a U. O or U. So we have the O sound with the dot on top, and we have the U sound with the dot on the side. So in this case, we have the dot on top, or like we see with the vowel indicator here, the vowel can be an O or U. And so when we look at the Lamed, which would be an L sound, we have the O right after the L that would give us Lo, Lo, Shalo but we have another letter at the end. It's called a mem, and because it's at the end, it's called mem sofit. Sofit means end. Sofit is similar to the word suffix, which means something that you add at the end of a word. So the suffix here, or the sofit letter, is mem, and mem has two forms. So when we look at the aleph bait, we learn that the mem actually has two forms. It looks more like an M on top normally, and then there's the box form we're seeing here where it's very boxed in, and that is called mem sofit. These sofit letters, there are five of them total, and the sofit letters really help us uh, understand when a word ends when it's ambiguous. So we actually know that these letters are important to understand how what they look like. So for instance, the kaf looks like a backward C. 
and it's a K sound when there's a dagesh in the center, the dot. Without the dagesh or dot, it is called not kaf, but chaf, a KH sound or transliterated CH, but pronounced chaf. And when it's at the end of the word, it's chaf sofit. You add the word sofit, which means chaf at the end of the word. Mem would then be mem sofit. Noon would be noon sofit. Pe without the dagesh would be fe. And then we know that the sound that we see here is from P to PH. And then when it comes to the PH sound, it's pronounced PE, or can spell it with an F, F, and that would be FE. So we have PE or FE, and then we have FE SOFIT, FE SOFIT. So now, when you talk about the cough, the mem, the noon, the pay, then finally the last one, sadi, or sadi sofit, we have five letters that look different at the end of the word, and we're using one of them in the word shalom. We're using shalom. The closing consonant is the mem sofit. So we know shalom is translated peace, but it really means wholeness. And we use it to say shalom or hello, or double in its presentation is shalom shalom, which is a double portion of peace, translated perfect peace in Isaiah 26, three. That God will give us perfect peace if our mind or our yetzer, our inclination of our thoughts is stayed or focused on him. So we can even see that as a double portion or the abundance of shalom, the abundance of peace. And we say shalom to say hello, but we also say things like in the morning, boker tov. Boker tov means good morning. Or we could say in the evening, erev tov, erev tov, which is good evening. Or at night we would say laila tov, laila tov. So you can say shalom, 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 but depending on what time of the day, like in the morning, you would say boker tov, boker tov, and that would mean good morning. So again, we have shalom as an open syllable going into a closed syllable, and it would be transliterated like this, shalom. Now, let's go back to the aleph, the aleph. Now remember, we talked about the aleph and the alpha, we talked about the aleph and the alpha, we talked about the bait and the beta or vita, the dalit and the delta, similarity, you see where the Greek tongue is influenced by the Semitic tongue, and the gimel gives us the Greek gamma, gamma. Well, I wanna sh share with you the pictographs for these letters. The aleph comes from eleph, which is an ox. It can also represent to the number uh, of a thousand. And that's because the letter Aleph is used in large to represent not just the number one, but a thousand. Once you go through the whole Aleph bait and all the Safit letters, you actually can use them as an alphanumeric system like Roman numerals. So the Aleph bait, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zayn, Chet, Tet, Yud would give us one through ten, and we would go on from uh, yud to Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samet, Ein, Pei, Sabi, Kuf, Resh. We'd be going down in tens to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, Sadi, and then you have the uh, Resh, and then Resh would be the, uh, the Ein, Pei, Ein, Pei, Sadi, Kuf, Resh. We'd have the letters that would equal all the way to 100, and then we would have the final letters would be the ones from 100 to 400. And then after 400, we go 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 100 by using the five Sufit letters. And then finally the Aleph again, which is the first letter for one, but we enlarge it when it's the way it's written to represent a thousand. So you have to understand that when it comes to the number system, like for instance, from 10, Yud, uh, and, and uh, 
the letters that would represent 20, like Kaf, 30 would be Lamed, Mem would be 40, uh, and then 50 would be Noon, and 60 would be Samek, Ein would be uh, the, uh, okay, so we'd have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 would be Ein, Pe would be 80, Sadi would be 90, and then Kuf would be 100, Resh would be 200, Sheen would be 300, and Tav would be 400. And then you would be forced to go back to the Sophit letters to represent the numbers 500, 600, 700, 800, 900. So you're going from Kaf, Chaf Sophit, Mem Sophit, Nun Sophit, Be Sophit, Sadi Sophit, then you go back to an enlarged aleph for 1,000. So aleph is the picture of an ox, just like aleph is an ox head, but it can also represent the fact that a leader has the capacity of 1,000 because Moses was told by Jethro, his father-in-law, that the leader, the aleph, or the aleph, has to have capacities. So you pick leaders that have a capacity of 1,000, then hundreds, then fifties, then tens. So highest, highest capacity, a high capacity leader has thousands underneath his belt that he can lead. And one to put a thousand to fight, two to put 10,000. So there's a great connection between Aleph as the number one and also as a thousand. So Hebrew words have a, a core root, a shorish, but then you can use them for various things. So let's go ahead and sound our Aleph Bait through at this time. And let's start with the letter Aleph. Now we said that the Aleph is an Aleph, which is an ox. Bait, we called the bite, the house. And then Gimel was a Gamal, a camel. And we found out the Dalit or Delta was a door. What kind of a door? A triangular door because it was a tent door. If you think of a tent, it's a triangle. And this is important because when you talk about Judaism and you talk about our faith, we know that King David is one of the kings of Israel, the first king of Judah, that we actually have a star of David named after him called the Magin David. And when you talk about the star of David and you talk about the significance of it, David's name is spelled with a Dalit. In fact, it has two Dalits. So I think it's important for us to know that the letter Dalit uh, is not only spells a name, but it ends his name, and the letter in between, the Vav, is actually a hook. So if you think about hooking these two together, you can actually see the connection between the Star of David and the letter Dalit hooked with a Vav for another Dalit, and it becomes a picture of a triangle. So we actually have the idea of the Star of David, which are two triangles joined together, Star of David. So when we looked at the star, it becomes a monogram for David's name, a monogram. So we understand that this monogram has become a sign and symbol for the Jewish people. So basically it's the letter Dalit, a triangle hooked with another Dalit because that's the way it looked in Paleo-Hebrew. So when you think of the significance of that Dalit or that Delta, which is originally the Greeks borrowing from Dalit, they're both triangles and you can see the significance of his name hooked together. The Vav would be a hook between the two. So if we see that hook between them, uh, we know that the letter Dalit is considered a triangle or tent door. So let's see if we can actually look at the Aleph Bait system and sound it out at least one time here, starting with the first five letters. Ready? One, two, three. Aleph Bait Gimel Dalit he, Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud. Let's do those five again. 
Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud. Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech. Ein, Pe, Tzadi, Kuf, Reish, Pass 2. Shin, Tav. Tov Meod, very good. Metsuyan, wonderful. So now let's see if we can jump into our portion today, which is Parshat Korach. Parshat Korach. It says in number 16, 1, now Korah or Korach, son of Itzar, son of Kahat, son of Levi, the sons of Reuben, Datan and Aviram, sons of Eliav, and On, son of Pelet, rose up against Moses or Moshe and took 250 men from B'nai Israel. They were men of renown who had been appointed, appointed to the council. Uh, verse 2 says, they rose up against Moses and took 250 men from B'nai Israel, men of renown. It says in the Jewish Publication Society's version, the JPS, princes of the congregation who had been appointed to the council. We'll come back to the word congregation in a minute. But verse 3 says, They assembled against Moses and Aaron. They said to them, You've done too far. All the community or all the congregation is holy. Then why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the congregation? So let's go back to this concept of Korach as a name. The root is Karach. Karach. Karach means to be bald or made bald. That means no hair on your head. The head is pictographed as the letter resh, resh. What is this letter resh? It's the 19th letter of the Hebrew Aleph Beit, and it is the picture of a rosh, rosh, which means head. So resh is the pictograph of a rosh. It's where we get the word rishon which means first, first, because again, this headship authority means that you are first or in charge. It even refers to being the, the head of the year, as in Rosh Hashanah, Rosh. We have other letters that are pictures of a head, which would be like the ox head of strength that Avraham's name is named after, and that is the letter Aleph, Aleph. And we have not only the head, but we have the idea of the letter Ein, which is the eyes on the face or the head, just like the head has a mouth from the letter Pe, which means mouth or an opening. It's interesting, though, that another word for referring to head is the word, we, a, a word that we say face, as in Panav, Panav, his face or presence, from the blessing number 627a, Yisa Adonai Panav Lecha. Adonai, turn his face towards you. Panav means his face. Panav. The actual singular would be Panim. Panim. So I want to talk about these letters, not only that are pictographs, like the letter Yud which is the open hand, or the letter kuf, the back of the head, or described by some as referring to a monkey. Uh, maybe the back of the monkey's head is really big. Or like things in our mouth, like our teeth, that can be like fire that eats or consumes everything when you overeat. <laughs> so we have teeth in the mouth. Again, the letter pe is the mouth, but the teeth in the mouth is the letter sheen. So that goes to a question on these words that are body parts. They are nouns, nouns. And nouns can be masculine, zahar, feminine, nekava, singular, yachid. Yachid is like echad, one. Yachid means singular. And it can also be plural. Nouns can be plural, which is rabin as in rabbi, meaning great. So great in number or great in stature. Rabbah, rabim. We have rabim, which is plural. 
So for instance, if you look at the letter bait, let's look at our Begit Kirfat letters. These are letters that have a special rule when the Dagesh is inside them, six of them total. A Begat Kirfat is the letter bait, Gimel Dalit, and the letter Kaf, Pe or Fe, and Tav. And these six letters, as an acronym, Begat Kirfat, actually have a special rule in reference to the dagesh or dot in the center of them. At least some of them retain this special rule that for many hundred thousands of years changed the sound of the letters. For instance, the letter bait would be a strong B if the dagesh is in it. The letter bait is a house. But bait means house of because we found out that the letter bait was the picture of a bite. So bite, like a bite of food, bite is house, bait means house of. So I could say, for instance, the mountain of God's house, har ha bite, that's the temple mount. Har meaning mountain, ha meaning the, as a prefix in front of bite, bite, which is house. And again, when we talk about the house, we're talking about the house of God, which was referring to the temple, the temple. As we believe God that the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD would be rebuilt in our time, known as the rebuilding of the third temple, so that one day in the New Jerusalem, we can celebrate and worship God in God's holy temple. In present, there is just the Dome of the Rock, which I was able to go on the Temple Mount and take a picture here of the Dome of the Rock in 2018, my last trip to Israel before the pandemic, my first trip to Israel here on the Mount of Olives, and seeing a picture of this same view on the Mount of Olives with friends in 2007, my first trip to Israel. Been there four times, can't wait to go back, maybe 2022. And the view that many see has a Muslim uh, temple or, or a mosque there in, in honor of Muhammad. And this is the Dome of the Rock Mosque, this gold dome. What will be there in the New Jerusalem is the temple. And we're believing God for rebuilding the temple. Until then, we just have these models of the temple from the first century. So when we talk about Har Habayit, the mountain of the house, that will also speak loudly about what we want to address as a congregation. What is a congregation? What is the temple? What was a synagogue in those days? So we have the word house, which is bite, but sometimes we have the letter bait, which is a picture of a house. And then gimel is another letter, gimel, which we have gimel, or we found out about the pictograph as gamal, gamal, which is a camel. And then we have names like David, David, we said a dalit, a vav and a dalit is a dalit or triangle hooked through the letter vav with another dalit, another triangle making a star of David. Or how about when we talk about Caleb, the name Caleb, Kalev, is actually from Kelev, dog. Or we said the letter pe is like the word for mouth, pe, same word. Or a construct would be pi, like pi Adonai, the mouth of the Lord. And so when a person comes back to Jewish faith from other religions or returns back to God in repentance, we call that teshuvah, teshuvah. Teshuvah, teshuvah is actually repentance or returning back to God. Many pronounce it as teshuva. But in Israel, they even say it faster. They'll say tshuva, tshuva. Tshuva is returning back to God or to repent. So when you talk about nouns being masculine, feminine, singular, or plural, let's take a look at an example of what it takes to learn Hebrew. You need to be a student. A male student or disciple is called a Talmid. Talmid. It is masculine, singular. Or we have Talmidim, which are disciples or students, masculine, plural, Talmidim. So we have Talmid, for a male student, and we have Talmida for a female student, feminine singular, Talmida. So we have Talmid and Talmida. 
And the plural of Talmid was Talmidin for masculine plural, but feminine plural is Talmidot, Talmidot. So that is the suffix ending, the OT of OT is what you see for the ending of Talmid or Talmida for feminine plural. So usually the A ah sound makes it feminine and the OT makes it feminine plural. The im is usually the sound you hear av eh, for a masculine plural noun. But we also have feminine noun indicators like in names or in females like Sarah, 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 feminine in ending, a ah sound. Or Rivka, Rebecca, feminine sound at the end. Or Lea, Lea, feminine sound at the end. Or Sometimes you'll have a name that's a little different, like Rachel. Rachel, obviously, it's a woman. Rachel, the wife of Jacob, along with uh, Leah. And then we have the word for woman, Isha, coming from the masculine word Ish for man. Isha, so that's a female, like Ish is a male. And then we have Ima, Ima, mommy from M, mother. So you're looking at these words that sometimes we see that all words ending with either the kamats he, the a sound, the sagol he, the e sound, the patah tav for the at, or the hirik yud tav for it, or the cholam vav tav for ot, or we have the kubuts, we have the uh, the sound here for ut, ut, and as you look at this word, excuse me, the shuruk, not the kub kubuts. So as we have this word here uh, for that ends with an u sound, ut, ut, we see that it is the the U and the Tav or the T for Ut for certain words. For instance, if we look at the Kamats He for Sarah, or we have the Kamats He for Rivka, you're talking about the matriarch, the wife of Abraham, or Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, or Leah, the wife of Jacob, first wife of Jacob, or the language of Anglit, Anglit, which is the English language. Anglit, like the Angles or Anglo-Saxon or the Anglican Church or the English language. So English Anglit, you hear the similarity to the Angles, a tribe of the Angles and the Saxons got together and we have the word Anglo-Saxon as a compound. Or the word for daughter, bot, bot is the patak tav. We also have malchut, malchut. So we have the ut sound at the end, malchut, coming from melech, which is king. Malchut means kingdom of. So I say malchut shemayim, it's the kingdom of heaven. Or how about names of countries and cities that are feminine noun indicators? So land and countries or cities are feminine. So Eretz, land or earth, is feminine. Mitzrayim is Egypt, that's feminine. Kanaan, which is Canaan, is feminine in gender. Hebron or Hebron is feminine. And the word city in Hebrew, Ir, is feminine. Ir is where we get Yerushalayim, city of peace or double peace, Shalayim. Or how about paired body parts? We started talking about Korach meaning bald, meaning he had no hair on his head. But the word Yad, Han, is feminine. Ein, or the eye, is feminine. Ozen, or ear, is feminine. Regal, or foot, is feminine. Sh shin, or tooth, is feminine, shen. So we have shen, like the letter sheen, 
we have a feminine body part here. So all of these are, whether on a man or a woman, are considered feminine in gender when we refer to these body parts. Now what's strange is in the plural, it changes. There is an exception. The plural form uses a masculine suffix. So st strangely enough, a feminine gender noun like yad does use a masculine in for yadayim. Yadayim is plural for hand. So we have yad, yadayim. Ein or I would get a, the im sound at the end for a, what looks like a masculine suffix. Enaim, enaim. So ein with the im at the end becomes enaim, enaim. Ozen for ear becomes oznaim, oznaim. And regel for foot becomes raglaim, raglaim. So we have feet. And then shen, tooth. And we have shenaim, shenaim, teeth. So important when we're studying these body parts and we think about all these letters like the letter pei and yud and ein and kuf and shin all these body parts when we think about korach who was bald because karach means to be bald or make bald we know his resh his head of authority was bald meaning it was a symbol that there was no longer authority on his head. It's interesting, this is where the priests would cover their head because their authority came from God. Just like Israelis and Jewish people around the world wear a head covering because our glory is God. He is the one who gives us authority and power. He makes us high priests in our homes to our children, to our spouse, to our family. So let's also talk about the idea of the congregation or the community and let's talk about Israel as a congregation or a community and let's look at the words that we find for a congregation and we have just like we have in Exodus 35 2 Vayakel which comes from Kahal Kahal the Shoresh for to assemble or to gather together in the infinitive form, it would be lehit kahel, lehit kahel, to assemble or gather together. It means literally to assemble or to gather together. But kahal, kahal, which is referring to that gathering, can be seen in Greek as the ekklesia, ekklesia, for kahal or kehila, kehila, the congregation. It's interesting that ecclesia in Greek is where we get in Spanish iglesia for church. And so we looked at many, many times before talking about the ecclesia, the Greek translation for the word kahal or kehila. We found out that ecclesia means a calling out to a popular meeting, a religious congregation, especially a Jewish synagogue sometimes seen as the Christian community as a whole, but notice the number one definition is a congregation or com Jewish commu synagogue. So this is because kahal is also an assemblage of people, an assembly, a company, a congregation, or a multitude. As in Numbers 8, 9, and you shall bring the Levites before the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall gather together the whole congregation of the children of Israel, which is why Acts 7.38 takes this Greek word, ecclesia, that we found that ecclesia is used to translate in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the word kahal or kehila, congregation. And it says in New King James Version, this is he, speaking of Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, referring to the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Pentateuch, the Torah, and those first words, Aserah Tadibrot, Ten Sayings or Communications that God had with Israel. 
So if we look at the King James Version of the same verse, Acts 7.38, it says, This is he, again speaking of Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the living oracles to give to us. So this is referring to the ecclesia, that Yeshua said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed to you who I am, that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, but my Father in heaven. And I also tell you, you are Peter, or Petros in Greek, which means a little building block or stone. And upon this Petra, a big foundational rock or stone, I will build my ecclesia, my community, my congregation, my called out believers, and the gates of Sheol, the gates of the grave, the gates of hell, the gates of the place of the unseen dead will not overpower it. So we know that's important to understand ecclesia that is normally translated like in New King James in Matthew 16, 18 as church. Upon this rock I'll build my church. But the idea is that it goes back to the Greek word ecclesia or kahal or kehila an assembly of people speaking of the assembly of the Jewish community or the congregation or the congregation of the wilderness, which is the church in the wilderness. So Israel was the first church in the wilderness or congregation of the Lord. They're the model for all other congregations. And God caused them to gather around his Torah to study his Torah, to meditate in it day and night. Now, we found out that ecclesia in Greek is iglesia in Spanish for church, but it really means not a building, but a called out meeting of people. The word for building is found in Luke 4.16, that Yeshua returned in the power of the Ruach, which is the Spirit, to the Galilee, and news about him went out through all the surrounding region, and it says, he taught in their synagogues. Now, this is a building. And everyone was praising him. And he came to Nazareth, which is Nazareth, where he had been raised, as was his custom. He went into the synagogues on Shabbat, the Sabbath, and he got up to read. When you're reading this, this word synagogue or synagogue, synagogue, actually means a building for the called out believers. So whether you're talking about the temple, a synagogue, or sitting on the Mount of Olives, listening to Yeshua teach under a tree, or you're walking along the Sea of Galilee, that is your ecclesia. That is your calling out to a meeting to follow Yeshua. And I really believe that today we should all be followers of the rabbi who not only walked the Sea of Galilee, but traveled to Jerusalem and worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and st studied and taught the Torah just like Moses, Moshe, taught the Torah. It's the same revelation. The only thing is Yeshua came to personally fulfill it, walk among us, and embody it, and teach us how to follow him as the way, the truth, and the life back to our Heavenly Father in Teshuvah, in full repentance and returning back to God as our creator so that we could know how to walk out the Torah, not only from the stone inscribed by his finger, but from the letter that is written in our heart. Not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law when the Holy Spirit writes his Torah on our hearts, according to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. So hopefully that has blessed some of you just learning about Korach. But what we know about Korach Korach, uh, if we look at the Blue Letter Bible, remember our resources for versions is Bible Gateway. Our resources for Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek is Blue Letter Bible. And now we're going to be able to look at the portion here in Numbers 16, verse 1. Here it says, Vayikach Korach. And he took, who took? Korach took, who is he? Ben Yitzhar. Ben Yitzhar. He is Ben Kahat, who is a descendant of Aaron. Ben Levi, 
right? Bin Levi, and uh, or actually, excuse me, let me say it again. Bin Kahat, which is a descendant of Levi, Bin Levi, and Aaron comes from that same line. And it says, Vedatan, it says, Ve'aviram, it says, B'nai Eliav, the son of Eliav, so Datan and Aviram, the son of Eliav, it says, Ve'on, another name, it says, Ben Pelet, right, Ben meaning son, B'nai means sons of, B'nai Reuven, which is the sons of Reuben, sons of Reuben. So look at Korach, and we see here Korach, Korach, has a meaning. What is the meaning? From Karach, meaning to be bald, bald. And then we can see how it renders his name in Greek, Kore. And the idea of him being bald, you have to go to that root. Just to be bald, to make bald, to make baldness, to make oneself bald, to make oneself bald, to be bald in all the forms of Kal, Nifal, Hifil, and Hofel, or Hofal, excuse me. And we see here that karak is a verb meaning to be bald or baldness, usually by mourners of the dead. They would cut their hair. We also know that it's translated here, the root in Leviticus 21.5, Deuteronomy 14.1, Jeremiah 16.6, Ezekiel 27, 31. 29.18 and Micah 1.16. And again, here's a little photo of the actual older book that this is printed from. And you can see they'll have different forms of the word. All right, so here we basically have the closing out of looking at our lesson today. I'm not sure if we have uh, any of our Hebrew students from the synagogue or Miriam or Joseph from India that are with us if they have any questions at this time. Uh, maybe, Joseph, you have a question today? No, I'm good today, Rabbi. Oh, you're good today. All right. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah. Glad, I'm glad you're good today. And Miriam, do you have any questions today? You good? I guess Miriam is good and probably Renee is good. Um, so if not, I, it is 814. I'm going to go ahead and close out for today. Did you guys enjoy the lesson today? Did you guys enjoy the lesson today? Yes, awesome. Rabbi. Awesome. All right. We're going to go ahead and close out. Uh, I just want to say that one thing that we do learn from this, we don't want to be like Korah that questioned the leadership of Moses and Aaron. We want to be those kind of leaders like the leaders that Yeshua raised up to honor and respect leadership. Joshua and Caleb always respected Moses and Aaron, and even to respect the female leadership like Miriam, Miriam. We need to respect the leaders that God puts in our congregations. We should never be one to divide the congregation, the ecclesia. We should never be one to divide within the synagogue, the synagogue or the congregation or the church that you're a part of. We should always learn how to bring unity and to work together as a team, knowing our capacity. that Some of us have the capacity to lead thousands, some only the capacity of hundreds, some 50, and some only 10, maybe like in a small group or a life group. But as long as we're all working for the same goal, never be like Korah, the cousin of Moses, questioning his leadership when God placed him there. We should always welcome and receive the leaders that God puts in our life. And if we're going to follow Yeshua, Trust me, he will make us fishers of men. We will be able to not win people to us, but win people to the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and close out today and with the Aharonic benediction. Search your hand for the blessing. Amen.
Be'asim l'cha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace and star shalom, the Prince of Peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, we pray. B'shem Yeshua. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. All right. We will see you soon. God bless you. Lila Tov. Thank you.